Hi, Sai. Where Hi. are you? I'm in my studio. I'm in, our, in the shed. Oh, oh is, it the, is it a studio shed? That's right. I forgot yeah. you were doing that. Yeah. Have you had it a couple of years now or is it still quite? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I finished it um, about April 2018. Yeah, so it's, it's where I come every day. Oh, you need a little, needs a little bit of a tidy there, so I some think yeah. you've got a few skew with pictures, mate. You yeah, know, no, it's, it's a real mess. <laughs> I was thinking of it today, and I said, "Oh shit, I've got that thing with Leela. I've been fucking up before, but no, I've never quite made it." Man. Oh, awful! Yeah, sorry, oh. I've been so judgmental. No, that's so it's great. You loved, you just love that feeling of uh, going to work in the studio, but it's just like a little a little toddle down the lawn. <laughs> yeah, basically, I do. It's um, it's a you know, I obviously don't do music in here every day. I mean, I I just use it as an office as well for for work. But um, just having you know a piano here and all my guitars and stuff, it's yeah, it's quite inspiring and 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 helped me during the lockdown immensely. Yeah, I bet. Oh my yeah. gosh. How are you guys doing? Yeah, all right, thanks. Um, struggling a bit um, to just finish what we start. We started sort of making new songs in September and then got really into like yeah we can do this and then the just the last hurdle of really committing to a couple of things in songs you know the last couple of songs where you yeah you revise and revise um and the last month has been tricky just because we've not been able to put our little our little boy in any kind of nursery for a bit of a morning or anything because there's been lots of covid shutdowns and i mean obviously schools are shut but nursery schools were were open so yeah. we thought we could put him there for a bit and then it was closed and open anyway. So, you know, we're just just juggling being parents and... Uh, well, you're doing great with your lockdown videos with Sonny on drums and guitars and stuff. So that's I awesome. Know. We've got to do some more, actually, because they're just they're really fun when we get going. But actually, you realise, you know, we do live with a bit of a diva. So if we're like, do you want to try that one on the drums? Should we go and record? Should we make a little video? So that's fun. You know, if he decides no, he wants to do Lego instead then. Yeah. You know, but... Um, <laughs> He's he's into the specials this week, and he likes he likes going around the house saying Natty Boom Town. So uh, he's into Ghost Town. So maybe that'll be our next video. So uh, he's a rude boy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll try and get a few rude boy moments on video. That'd be good. <laughs> but listen, I mean, God, yeah, I, I wanted to call you a few weeks ago and again say thanks for your reworking of Stolen <laughs> Careful. But now we're right in the week of your you know your album of the day on six music and everything's happening for you i feel like oh no sorry i've uh, i've called you on the one not at all no one, i think so. one... things have things have slowed down now i mean um, once the record's out you know it tends to kind of the, the week of release was pretty busy with with stuff but um this week should be all right yeah so. oh, yeah do you have you been feeling pretty pretty buzzed up that you managed to complete yeah, yeah. lockdown and then get it out in another lockdown <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's well, you know, everybody knows it's a it's a super weird time to be making music, putting music out. But I actually um, quite enjoyed it. I know that's strange, but the se the second lockdown was was more about getting ready for for this bit. Um, the first lockdown was definitely um, enabled me to mix the record here at home, which. Yeah. I love doing uh, it because it, it, nobody was knocking on the door, you know, for a record. Nobody's there's no deadline. I didn't have to sort of deliver it by this date. So it enabled me to kind of really concentrate, which is not something I'm, I'm naturally good at. Yeah, uh, so what, you weren't scheduling any Bella Union meetings with other people or anything. So it was all your time. You know what that first lockdown was like. It was so strange and, you know, nobody really knew what to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. We hadn't worked it out like we have this time. Um, so for me, it was like, OK, I'm just going to go in the studio and not come out until I've mixed that song, you know, and that's that's sort of how it worked. I don't think I would have done it as well without the lockdown. I know that sounds strange, but it, it sort of afforded me all that extra time to the, the nobody was buzzing me going, can you solve this problem or this banner on tour and a stock or there wasn't anything. So it was easy. Oh. Kind of yeah. a weird magic about it all, really. Isn't it? Because yeah. obviously, it's obviously we know how stressful and devastating it's been. But the flip side is that people have been allowed a personal space never before seen, which is quite yeah. incredible. Yeah, and I think because we spend so much time with our own head, in our own heads, it's sort of I don't know. It's been actually quite. A big learning time for me during this last year 
about you know m myself really I you I because you're always so busy when you're in the, when doing what I do for the last whatever 25 years running the label and then re more recently trying to fit making music in it's just always non-stop but I think the lockdown has sort of forced me to um take a breath you know yeah and get healthy um which is not something i've ever done before i don't think ever done before since i was Rich, like, you're, you're rocking your track seat there so have you been uh, been for a sort of uh, mini marathon this morning not yet <laughs> for a bit, like, bit kicked out, will, kick out on the out. lawn <laughs> i will be going out later i go out every day for a couple of hours i don't run or anything because that's not good but I, I i walk a lot yeah and um it's been great for me you know put the headphones on and uh, listen to a audio podcast or whatever and um all of a sudden you know you've walked twenty thousand steps or 10 yeah. kilometers or whatever and that that's not something i've ever done before and i actually love it i look forward to going out you've like, always oh, walked the dog though haven't you it's you, a different it's, thing it's, it's, a, it's a totally different thing walking a dog to uh properly walking and building up a bit of a sweat and and getting your heart rate going it's walking the dog you're really just sort of walking <laughs> chucking the ball you know watching him dig a hole and we go down to the beach because we're right by the beach here so he just standing by the sea chucking a ball into the sea there's there's nothing particularly you know <laughs> there's no exercise involved there really <laughs> oh don't break the myth for me i feel like i'm doing so much when i take my dog out but but it's true i'm, I'm only getting a sweat on because i'm wearing a really thick puffer jacket i've got, <laughs> yeah. I've got to get real haven't i <laughs> I mean, I do that during the week. In the weekend, I get taken to like a forest, or once a month, I meet my meet my friend who's got a dog who I, who's one of my oldest mates, and we go on a proper hike with the dogs. But generally, just the daytime walks are quite, you know, they're not hardcore. But um, I I needed to do hardcore exercise. Well, for me, hardcore is is a walk. <laughs> but, um, after you know, thirty years of doing absolutely bugger all that's um that's a big deal for me so i feel great i feel so much more positive about life yeah we have sort of entered we just all entered new chapters haven't we mm. new new insights and sort of new world views i feel that's it yeah what well, I, I was wondering if um you you, you re remixing or reworking the the track i wonder if you've got a taste of what it's like to be the collaborator because with lost horizons you know you send out some tracks to some people that you like and then they send stuff in and you say thanks but there's that sort of oh i wonder what they're going to do and then on the other side the collaborators sort of wondering what you might like and and, and yet just doing their own thing as well so i thought you, you probably don't taste that too often that sense no, that's true. And it, in fact, it's completely backwards of, of the way Lost Horizons works, which is create the music first, completely finish it so that it's almost like a, a finished mix almost, and um, and then send it off to the, the, the chosen singer, um, as you know, because you did one for us on the, on the first record. So um, this way around was basically start with a vocal and completely, you know, have to have to come up with music from from that way around take all the other music out and start again but I, I i love things like that i think it was a i thought it was a real challenge and because it came the idea came quite quickly and it worked because sometimes you can try something and it's like terrible and you get just you disheartened get, <laughs> yeah you get disheartened and then you're like oh I, i'm not gonna be able to do that and i might well have written you and go i don't think i'm gonna be able to do this but because what i tried worked very quickly uh, you know, within an hour or so, I had that kind of basic structure, and then it was just a case of sitting there and going, "Okay, what does what, is, what does this really need?" And yeah. then thinking, you know, is is Lila going to dig this, or is it, is it just going to be too weird? No, <laughs> it's certainly it's not a remix. In the, it, I mean, you know, yeah, it was such a wonderful thing to sort of receive in the inbox, really, because I didn't expect you to create a sort of dance track I mean when when we put things out we did say we're looking for remixes but that can be anything at all reconstruction so I sort of hoped that you might do something that would be like whoa you know I presumed you might play guitar or whatever but it was such a, a giant leap into sort of deconstruction and then rearrangement it was just beautiful and um no, it was one of my favorite it. things to do it definitely well, was one of my favorite so things much. To do. and I really liked how it turned out because 
and not because it was so different not not really that but just because it's almost like a a, a new song a, a beautiful new song that we did together do you know what i mean it just feels like well it feels like we worked together and yet we were yeah. apart and both busy on other things but yeah um, the, the word i was looking for was just so tantalizing it's so tantalizing to receive something that you know is essentially yours because you can hear yourself singing the words but everything shifted it's all recolored regraded reimagined and uh it's sort of like getting a present through the post you know really really so chuffed so well, i'm just i'm thrilled that it worked out because it quite easily couldn't you know because i think by the time after an hour i've completely forgotten what the original sounded like you know because you're so into this new construction new tempo new time signature or well, not new tempo but new time signature um yeah it was a real thrill to do it i can't i can't wait till people get to hear it i think it's we sorted it out just before christmas didn't we i think we have to we might just have to put a smattering of bells on it and put yeah. it out this year as a christmas single it's so so magical <laughs> it's so uh, so evocative or we we need to make a sort of um yeah kind of country album together maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i mean I'm, I'm you know i was always thinking how is this going to fit on the record because it will no doubt sound quite drastically different stylistically to everything else but well, penelope you know. have, have, have done you know not not the, not nothing like the same thing but they have equally stepped away from anything yeah. electronic really and which is what we hoped you know that's why we asked people to do what they did yeah and, I mean, I like the idea of it. In the 90s, when I was really young and working out what remix albums were, they were definitely all dance tracks. But I love the idea now that there's sort of um, collaborative, weird, esoteric things where one track to the next will be so disparate that, you you, you know, you'd be sort of startled. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think everything's put together in so many playlists now. Perhaps people are um, used to listening to things that sort of sound the same for 45 minutes. And I just like the idea that someone put it on, just be like, what the fuck is that now? You know? Yeah, oh, well, definitely. I mean, the, the, the whole Lost Horizons project seems to be, have taken that that route with, with this album anyway, because every song is so wildly different from the last. So I think that that's all right. You know, as long as you give people a bit of a chance to work out what it is you're doing. Because I think, it, you know, the traditional model of, single single album it it doesn't really work for something like my record it just doesn't because by the time if you put out a, the the porridge radio track let's say and then the john grant track which is you know one's a kind of post-punky vibe the other's like an eight minute sort of ethereal thing with no no drums people would be like what, what on earth is this lost horizons thing so i think having lots of tracks out before the actual record came out was was the best route to yeah. get people to kind of go oh okay you yeah, know i do i get i think i get what's going on here With your record it's like sort of stepping into a film soundtrack right you know i, I mean, that might be a little bit of an easy thing to say but you expect the unexpected and it should color a, a journey not not fit into a genre right you know that's sort of how i i think when you've got you know when you've got all the tracks you can you can then construct it into a journey i think when you're just doing it you're just relating to the music and you're just thinking okay who's the right person for this particular piece and because all the pieces were quite different um you know it was always going to be a challenge to make it sound cohesive but somehow i suppose just because me and richie are doing all the music it's our involvement that gives it the cohesiveness even though you know stylistically it leaps from one thing to another but um luckily it worked for sure remind me about oral thomas did you where did you where did you meet him how did that oh just online i mean like like all these things i mean um i richie and i were working on this piece of music and i just got an email from these kids in portland who um are part of his band and he, he's now 82 he's 82 and i think when they're uh in the 60s when he first started making music he was working with i mean some of the greatest names in, in, in music like james brown etta james Ot otis redding Stevie Wonder, you know, it was quite credible. Seriously, worked with all of those, all of those people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, yeah, exactly. It was, and uh, but of course, I only found this stuff out just recently. Um, and in the seventies, he, he just disappeared. He just completely, and the eighties, and the nineties, and the two thousands, he just completely budded out of the of the music business. Um, so these two kids in Portland 
who were uh, sort of DJ producers and also kind of, um, you know, crate diggers who go around record fairs looking for old records, heard that he was living in, uh, in Portland. So they contacted him, you know, hey, you know, we love your early stuff and what are you doing? And to cut a long story short, they, they formed a band with him, Ural Thomas and the Pain, and he started making music again in 2000 and kind of 12, 13, 14, 15, around then. So this is all quite recent, and I only just heard about it literally a, a year or so ago. And they were ringing me to ask me if I wanted, uh, emailing me to ask if I'd maybe put put his record out on Berlin Union. So I had to listen to the stuff, and I was like, "Oh my god, it's absolutely incredible!" And then I started think going back to my song and thinking, "Blimey, I tell you, whose voice would sound amazing on this track would be that guy, Ural Thomas." Um, but I mean, you know, I don't even know the guy. I'll, I'll just ask, you know, <laughs> I'll send the track over and just ask, because that's all you can do. Yeah. And if he doesn't like it, he doesn't like it. And then that's fine. We'll move on. But luckily, you know, he absolutely loved it. And they recorded it with him in the studio that they have. And they filmed a little video for us. And it couldn't have worked out better. No. Um, so one of the really magical moments on the record, for sure. Yeah. And what's your relationship with him now? I mean, do you do you speak on the phone or anything like that, or is it very much like? No, I don't think he even has a phone. I, you know, he's uh, he lives a very, very, very Spartan kind of lifestyle. I don't, I don't know whether he's even got electricity. He li he lives in like a wood shack, and um, I just speak to the producer guys. I do you know. do you put his records out? Have I missed? We that will stuff? be doing. We signed a, we, we're signing a, a record deal with him. Yes, oh. so that will happen. Um, probably later this year or early next year that he's just recorded a new album which is phenomenal do you think he's the kind of person who would would he be able to come over in that place and yeah he there? would love to i mean uh, they they were touring a lot yeah 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 they were touring a lot in uh, the last few years before all this mess happened and um they put two records out i think since about 2016 but none of them really ever came made it over here so I think that's why they, you know, contacted a couple right. of labels and that. And, and now they've got a home over here and we might see them. That yeah, point. that would be a beautiful thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, what a gorgeous man. Yeah, he sounds stunning. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's a bit of it, sort of absurdity to even ask. It's such an explosive question at the moment. What's going to happen in the next couple of years? But I mean, do you think, what do you think to some of the festivals running at the end of the year? And is next year just going to be only for sort of real big hitters so they're the only ones that are going to muscle in to get a chance to play and people like me are going to wait around till i'm sort of 57 before I'm uh, the show. Probably, probably i mean listen i don't have a crystal ball it's um it is hard to be to be sure i understand why promoters are booking things and and preparing for things because you know even just for their mental health they they, they have to you, you know you You've got to pretend like it's all going to be okay. You've got to have some hope there that it will be um, and crack on because otherwise what you're going to do is just going to sit staring at the floor. So I get why people are posting shows, posting festivals where maybe a larger amount of the population are sitting there going, mm, I don't know if that's, if that's going to happen or if I'm going to go to that. Um, but I think we've got to try and do something to to, to get some income back into the into the live music side because it's 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 just been destroyed. There's no other way of saying it. You know, it's been destroyed. Agents are, you know, are going out of business, promoters going out of business, clubs. It's it's just so terrible that there's got to be something that people are doing, even if it's forlorn. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to at least try. Um, yeah. So I understand that. W w whether they happen or not, yeah, I, I just don't know because, okay, we're probably all going to be immunized by the end of the summer, maybe. Um, but are people going to suddenly just run back into a club packed with other people? I don't know. I'm not 100% sure I would. Um, yeah, I, I sort of changed my opinion on that daily, really. Today, yeah. I feel like, yeah, I would. I'm so fucking bored and I've had enough of this. Yeah. So I would, but then maybe I need to be more responsible. And then, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel the same. I mean, I'm like, yeah, we should. But then, I mean, I'm 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 in a I'm in an at risk category. You know, I'm 58, nearly 59. I have bad asthma. 
Um, so I have to be careful with these kind of respiratory things. And I yeah. do not want to be, you know, I've, I've not gone on the tube, not gone on the bus, not gone on the train. I've kept out of the way of everything for the last, <laughs> whatever, sort of six to eight months. And I, am I ready to go into a club now? No, not, not now. And when I'm immunized, will I be? I don't know really. Give it a little while. See, yeah, yeah. I think we'll be just watching the news, I guess. Right. Yeah, I mean, I would go to end of the road festival if it if it happens because you can wander around at end of the road festival and not sort of feel on top of people. Glastonbury, not a chance. Well, it's not happening anyway. But um, a festival like that, I wouldn't outdoor do. festivals have got a chance, I suppose, haven't they? Because you can yeah. sort of convince yourself, well, we're outdoors. You know, we'll, we'll give well, it exactly. A I think that is a fair point. But I mean, going into a, a packed, sweaty, two hundred and fifty capacity room, I'm not one hundred percent sure I want to do that right now. Yeah. Well, we're all just living for the moment in a way that you know you read in self help books and in spiritual texts, and uh, don't really usually do that or heed that kind of instruction. But I would say right now we are really doing it. We're stuck in seriously living for the moment aren't we yeah and you know you've all got everyone's got to find their own path haven't they and it's um it's taken probably a, a year for people to work that out for me it's definitely taken me that long to to kind of think about myself my mind my body because the first half of last year I was just working and literally every minute non-stop and then at January the 1st I was like <sighs> Okay, if this has got to happen all over again and it's going to happen maybe throughout 2021, I can't just spend my whole day, 12 to 16 hours in the studio staring at, at you know, WAV wave files. It's just, it's not healthy. No. You know so, what? We're, we're the same. The sort of initial, well, it got quite warm quite quickly, didn't it? In lockdown number one. So we didn't really sort of look after ourselves. We were just out with our kids, you know, a lot, you know, messing about and stuff. It's taken till now to actually seriously think we might, you know, so we are also on a programme of getting fit in the mornings um, and just trying to sort of eat better and, yeah. you know, educate myself. I might start an online sort of course, you know, so suddenly just like yeah. a, a year on still in lockdown, you think, OK, right, I've got to do some serious um, developmental work. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I think that's a great, I think that that's why there are some benefits to have come out of this time. It's almost like the planet was telling us that we needed to reset the button. Do you know what I mean? Because, well, of course. you know, whether it's like a volcano that, that possibly is about to erupt in Iceland or, you know, forest fires or just all this stuff that's happening to the planet physically uh, in nature, you do wonder whether this is all just a massive big hello people i mean i'm i'm accused sometimes of being a bit schizotypy and trying to uh, connect all the coincidences in life and find reason in you know silly things but really i mean the fact that it's a respiratory disease at a time when we're worried about you know well at a time when it's not we're worried about it or that there's a, a um climate change the climate has changed there's no fucking about about it, you know mm. But the fact that it's linked to, to, to breathing and, and then, you know, you think about deforestation and much less oxygen and greenhouse gases. I mean, to me, it's sort of so symbolically charged that um, I mean, if governments don't do something about it right now, then we, we've, we've, we've lost our way as a, as a species, haven't we? I think we have already, you know. Um, I think it's, it is probably not too late. I watched that David Attenborough documentary which is those things are always quite depressing yeah, if, you, if you only watch like three quarters of it but if you watch the full film and you get to the last 10 minutes which is hard enough because it's mm -hmm. so brutal but oh, it's I was in floods it. of tears, yeah. yeah it's important to watch the end because you know he does say that there is hope there and I mean listen if, if, if Attenborough thinks there's hope there then there probably is but it's just you know whether governments have that will and I'm not sure they do because they're just all so selfish. I'm, I, I, maybe I'm so cynical. I don't think I'm that cynical, but maybe I am. I just felt like that was like a sort of production team sweetener. of like, oh, well, we've got to, you know, we can't make yeah. it so depressing that people won't tell their friends to watch it. So we better sort of round it on a, a you know, a slight positivity tip. Maybe. But, um, maybe. Yeah, I mean, if I listen, if, if, if you were an alien looking down on this planet, a hundred years ago, you could have probably seen what was happening. 
Yeah. That's taken us a ridiculous amount of time to wake up to. I know, from an industrial age to a digital age, and we're still just like revolting pollutants. It's just, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. grand. And now we're, now we're heading off to other planets to do the same there. Oh, I know. God, I mean, okay. you sit there watching a three-year-old trying to, you know, sort of pronounce the word, rover, it's a rover on Mars, and you're trying to sort of explain what it is. And then deep down you're thinking, and why the fuck they're doing this? You know, yeah, probably um, you know, obviously amazing scientists just for the sake of being able to do it. But you know, oh, they'll be mining some kind of uh, mineral up there that they'll ship back, and you know, and then they'll realise it's deadly poisonous, and you know, you might, <laughs> you're just there thinking, please what's the future hold. I can't. I actually can't bear to sort of try and contain it in my head. You know, yeah. this young person looking up at me, trying I to. Asking me where Mars is. <laughs> yeah, has 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 having Sunny like, well, obviously it changes it changes all of us when we have kids. But um, how have you sort of seen the change in yourself? Well, I've realised. I suppose it really highlights where where I'm not a good person, where I'm really impatient and not very nice. You know, it comes up really quickly when you, when you lack that, and and you have to sort of soothe them and then soothe yourself a bit and realize that actually yeah you you know you, you fucked up a bit so I suppose I've become more sort of brutally honest and that affects me artistically that sort of affects my lyric writing I think I just won't settle for something that doesn't really feel like it's getting somewhere poetically or holistically useful like I feel like something's got to be useful not political lyrics just it's got to be useful it's got to be like somehow important whereas maybe you would let the odd thing go or you'd be very sort of selfish lyrically previously be about one's emotions and now I'm like forget about me what about his future what about life after death what about oxygen you know <laughs> so maybe it's just uh it's just sharpened fucking lyrical pencil I suppose that's a good thing then yeah you know it gives you that authenticity that um I think all writers are are striving for especially in the you know when you're developing you as you say you're often just using words as a tool to you know get from a to b in a clever way or poetic way but then suddenly maybe something like having a child can really uh readjust the whole thing yeah yeah Realign it. and um you know I've, i have some regrets that i didn't try and focus and work harder when I had the freedom to you know now I have limited hours a day and I've got to be a really good person when he gets in from his little you know nursery morning or whatever I've got to be funny and fun and you know I'd quite like to just run back in the studio and finish some backing vocals but I can't so uh time you know I just yeah, time management <laughs> time is so precious and uh, yeah, I, I wake up so early these days. Like no, no, my my friends, the rest of like the Duke spirits can't believe it. I was such a terrible, you know, riser as it were. But now I'm, yeah, up with the birds. Up where are you? <laughs> Listen, I have actually got to go because okay. we have to, we have to take to a uh, an immunisation uh, appointment. Nothing to do with COVID, just kid stuff. Yeah. So I'll send you a massive hug. Yes. Back, back at you. Look uh, uh, Abby, Abby says a huge hug. And oh, you, yeah. Okay. Hug for Abby. Yeah. And um, yeah, we'll stay in touch. And um, All right, then. Lots of love. Thanks yeah, for talking today. Care. Good to get Yeah, lovely to talk, catch up with you guys. And um, right. love to everyone. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Thanks, Zai. Bye.